Since the dawn of civilization, spies of every nation and culture have worked to infiltrate their adversaries and glean the information that will give their side the advantage. The stakes are sky high, the strategies varied and imaginative, and the ultimate sign of success is that no one ever even knew you were there. In each episode, we will explore the moral and ethical gray zones of espionage, where treachery and betrayal go hand in hand with cunning and courage. This is the Spycraft 101 podcast. Welcome to your clandestine classroom. This is episode number 27 of the Spycraft 101 podcast. Joining me for this episode is John Pomfret. John is a former editor at the Washington Post and a foreign correspondent with the Associated Press. He spent more than 15 years covering events in China, Iraq, Afghanistan, Bosnia, Rwanda, Congo, Turkey, Iran, and elsewhere, all over the world. He's also the author of two books on his experiences living and studying in China leading up to the ill-fated student-led protests in 1989. I asked John to join me on the podcast to talk about his most recent book, From Warsaw with Love, Polish Spies, the CIA, and the Forging of an Unlikely Alliance. John, thanks so much for taking the time to speak to me about this amazing story. Uh, Justin, it's wonderful to be here. Thank you. I appreciate it. Now, this is the third book that you've written and published, and it appears to be a big departure from your previous works. So what led you to this amazing story? Well, I I mean, I was posted in Eastern Europe for four years in the early 90s, basically to cover the war in Sarajevo. But the Post Bureau, the Washington Post Bureau chief remained in, in Warsaw. And so I would be allowed back to Warsaw after covering doing war duty in Yugoslavia from time to time. And I jumped, kind of bumped into this amazing story about how the Polish Secret Service, basically the Polish spies, ex-communist spies, because Poland had already made the transition, had done the CIA an enormous favor in 1990 by saving six Americans from Iraq right after Saddam Hussein had invaded Kuwait. And that always, in my mind, kind of formed the kernel of what could be a fascinating book about how the Poles did it, what was the backstory, and then what happened after they saved these Americans. And that basically turned into From Warsaw with Love, this book about how the Polish intelligence officers forged an alliance with the United States. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating for sure. I was initially drawn to this book because I had heard a brief summary or read a brief summary somewhere else about this incredible rescue mission that you mentioned that took place in 1990, led by Polish intelligence operatives to save U.S. persons in Iraq. But once I started reading your book, I realized that this is a story about so much more than just this one particular rescue mission. In fact, this whole story of U.S.-Polish relations from the Cold War through the present is kind of a fascinating subject. And it felt like the U.S. and Poland were adversaries, but never really enemies in the way that we were with Soviet Union and other countries around that same period of time. Did you also get that sense of this adversarial but not enemy relationship? Definitely. Uh, I mean, you just look at the two countries and the peoples. I mean, you know, for one, there are nine million Americans of Polish extraction in the United States. So there's a literally a blood bond between the two countries. Way back in the Revolutionary War, in fact, the longest serving foreign officer in the Continental Army was a Pole by the name of Tadeusz Kosciuszko. And another Polish officer arguably saved George Washington's life during the Battle of Brandywine. So uh, the Poles have roots in our American Revolution. In addition, Americans supported the idea of an independent Poland even during the dark days in the 19th century when Poland was occupied partially by the Russians and partially by the Austro-Hungarian Empire. In fact, the 13th of Woodrow Wilson's 14 points at the end of World War I talked about the creation of a sovereign Poland with access to the sea. So these blood ties between the two countries have gone back a long way. And Polish operatives, Polish spies functioned in the United States really brazenly in the 1970s because they could leverage this idea that while the Soviets were definitely viewed as America's enemy, no one could really see the Poles as an enemy of the United States. And so they actually made use of that idea in order to to carry out their tradecraft and to steal a significant quantity of American secrets during the 1970s and and, and into the early 1980s. Hmm. Yeah, that's, that's amazing stuff, really. And this story that I know is a big portion of your book, 
that we'll get into in a moment is is really amazing at how successful this one particular individual was. But going back you know, a little bit further, you know, I was not aware of the history going back to the Revolutionary War at all. But you know, one thing that's very clear to anybody who studied 20th century history is that Poland has this very, very long history of being subjugated by its neighboring powers. And I think part of that is geographical, and there's a lot of reasons about that. But can you talk a little bit about this very peculiar, particular place that Poland found itself at the end of the of World War II with Soviet encroachment into Eastern Europe and the Allies kind of dividing up Europe and in particular Germany among themselves? Yeah, so the first thing to understand about Poland is that it's flat. I mean, really flat. And so if you if you're if you're using cavalry, it's an invasion route for cavalry, and if you're using tanks, it's a perfect invasion route for tanks. And so Poland's history has been that of a country occupied by its neighbors, whether it's the Germans or the Russians or the Swedes or the Austro-Hungarians, for decades and in fact for centuries. And so there's there's that issue happening. Poland is also a country that has a high level of justified paranoia that countries other than Poland are going to be involved in deciding its fate. So in 1939, the Soviets and the Nazis had a meeting in Moscow in which they basically decided that they were going to divide Poland up into a Russian or Soviet sector and a, and a German sector, which is what happened in September of 1939 with the Blitzkrieg Nazi invasion, which was followed almost immediately by a Soviet invasion of Poland from, from the east. Flash forward to 1947 at the end of the Second World War, and Poland's fate is again decided by other powers, powers other than Poland, by, by the United States, by the Brits, and by the, the Russians. I mean, basically, Stalin's demand of Roosevelt was that if the Russians were going to enter the war on the side of the United States in the Asia sector, and basically fighting the Japanese, then both the Brits and the Russia and the Americans would have to effectively cede Poland to the Soviet sphere of influence, which is what happened in 1945 at the Yalta Conference, which was then concretized in elections in 1947 in Poland, sham elections, I would say, in which the communists, quote unquote, won the election. Poland has always felt, and many Poles always felt, that the sins of Yalta needed to be expunged somehow. And so in 1989, when Poland had its epical change, becoming, you know, sort of throwing off Soviet domination, and embracing the West, the Poles wanted to become, wanted to enter into NATO as a way to end the sins of Yalta and start a new era with, uh, with Poland firmly and staunchly a member of the Western sector. Hmm. Okay. So even though they had obviously been involved in this Cold War espionage against the U.S., which we're going to talk about in a moment, they were able to make amends pretty quickly after the, you know, the Berlin Wall came down and the Soviet government, you know, began to collapse and so did all of the other communist governments. That's that's kind of surprising. Do you think it's because of those long-term cultural ties or was it other reasons that had to do with why they were able to, you know, come back into the fold of Western Europe, so to speak, so quickly? I think the Poles always viewed themselves as not part of Soviet land, if you will. I mean, Stalin famously said, he said two things about the Poles. He said, instituting communism in Poland is like saddling a cow. It just didn't really work. And he also <laughs> called the Poles radishes, right? They were only, they were red on the outside, but they weren't red on the inside. Oh, so wow. That's the, Poles, perfect. the Poles never really took to communism. And an important reason for that is that Poland always had another kind of locus of authority or kind of identity. Uh, and that was the Catholic Church. In fact, Pope John Paul II played an enormous role in Poland in encouraging and pushing Poland away from the Soviet Union and toward the West. So I think that was a, a significant factor in, in the fact that culturally Poland was much more accepting and desirous of becoming a part of the West than, than staying as part of the Soviet bloc. Okay, yeah, that, that makes sense for sure. So we've already kind of alluded to it a little bit here, but talking about the espionage from the 1970s that you mentioned, there's this story of uh, Marian Zaharsky, and his work in the U.S., which is a major portion of the book, you know, years before this eventual rescue effort that you talk about. So were you able to actually speak with Marion Zaharsky himself and get the story from him about his work inside the United States? Yeah, Marion Zaharsky was extremely forthcoming 
in detailing uh, his intelligence operations in the United States. We met three times in Geneva, outside of Geneva, where he lives in Switzerland to this day. He is an interesting character, but he's also illustrative of the fact that the CIA, which was aware of Zaharsky's activities later on, in fact, it was a tip to the CIA that, that led the FBI to finally arrest him in 1981, the CIA really had a professional respect for Zaharsky's tradecraft. And like many other Polar spies, Zaharsky was, was a natural in a way, a really gifted person, a case officer, if you will, at developing Amer an American source. In Zaharsky's case, his source happened to be a senior engineer at Hughes Aircraft Corporation at a period of time when Hughes Aircraft Corporation was at the forefront of experiments to create an early iteration of American stealth technology, which, as, as your listeners very well know, is a, it forms a critical part of the armaments of not simply the Army and the Navy and the Air Force, but all of the American armed services. And so Harsky kind of stumbled into this relationship with Bill Bell. Bill Bell happened to, this, this engineer, Bill Bell happened to live in the same condo complex as Zaharsky was living in Playa del Rey, right outside of LAX in Los Angeles. At the time, Zaharsky was a machine tool salesman for a Polish company at a period of time when Poland was trying to sell its wares around the world into American markets, but also into any other market that would have it in order to repay a huge amounts of debt that the Polish government had taken on as a way to put food on the shelves and increase the, the sort of the, the quality of life in Poland during during communism. Right, right. And that's fascinating that Zaharsky was so good at what he did and got such a like a whale of a source right off the bat because he was not initially like a trained spy or a trained source handler or anything like that, right? He was picked much later on after he'd come to the United States, wasn't he? Yeah, that's that's one of the amazing. He was sort of a natural, but he was he, he, was, he was not dispatched to America to, 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 to conduct intelligence operations. And in fact, he was dispatched to America to essentially sell machine tools into the U.S. industry, which he did actually with great success. And only after he was posted in L.A. did Polish intelligence on one of his home leads back to the home country, back to Warsaw, did Polish intelligence contact him and said, hey, you're in L.A., why don't you spy on our behalf? And initially, his remit was not to steal American military technology. It was, better, it was basically to, to, to try to get information so that Poland could improve its machine tools. But he meets Bill Bell at his condo complex, and Bell turns out to be this bankrupt alcoholic who is desperate for friendship. Who And then Bell begins to sort of basically spill all his secrets to Zaharsky, and Zaharsky's gobsmacked and like, what do I do with all this stuff? He begins delivering it to the Polish consulate in Chicago, and then taking some of it directly onto flights back to Warsaw. And the Poles are completely gobsmacked by this massive intelligence hall. Their experts spend days in a locked room pouring over these, 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 these plans that Zaharsky has stolen. They don't understand it. And they finally have to call on the KGB and the Russians to come down to basically look at the stuff. And they're having, they have great difficulty figuring out as well. So much so that some Polish counterintelligence officials came up with the somewhat cockamamie idea that the Americans allowed Zaharsky to take this stuff back to Warsaw, knowing that it would show to the Russians how far advanced America had become, that the Russians would basically have to give up their Cold War and give in to the United States. I don't know, actually think the FBI let this stuff leave <laughs> right, on purpose. Right. But nonetheless, the, the Poles were just amazed and, the, and the, the Russians ultimately were amazed at the quality of this intelligence and how advanced American military technology had become. Well, well, I mean, that speaks really highly to our, our engineers and our ability to develop this stuff, but then for it to fall right into their hands when they weren't even at the point of, of conceiving of some of these technological gains is, is terrible for us, but it was great for Marion, obviously. So obviously, yeah. <laughs> you, you mentioned a couple of times that he was a natural at this. What was it that made him a natural at this if he was a machine tool salesman working here with no you know interest in spying from the beginning? He had a remarkable ability to insinuate himself in with Americans. So he was a good tennis player, 6'2", great shape, 
He was in his early, well, actually mid-20s, very good-looking guy, beautiful wife, two young kids. So he kind of was the archetypical, you know, salesman on the make. And he was a really good salesman. And so he could sell things. And one of them was the opportunity to cooperate with Polish intelligence and take a little beer money here and there. And pretty soon he's giving Bell, who was bankrupt and facing prosecution by the IRS for back taxes, a significant amount of money so that Bell could pay off his debts and then put a down payment on a condo and buy a new car and get himself fancy sunglasses, etc. But Saharsky's kind of natural narcissism, if you will, but also his very attractive personality was a huge calling card in LA in the 1970s. And he was embraced by everybody. I mean, Rockwell, which was in the process of building the B-1 bomber, sends him a letter asking him to bid on some of their projects for machine tools. This is a period of time when Warsaw Pact products were banned under federal law from being used in any American military contracting. But nonetheless, Rockwell is there with a letter to him saying, hey, Marion, you want to bid on this? He was involved in selling machine tools to other companies that were that, that manufactured American nuclear weapons. So it's extraordinary how it wasn't simply Bell who embraced him, but it seemed like all of the aeronautics businesses in, around Los Angeles, which was a hotbed for that type of industry at the time, embraced him as well. Wow, that, that is amazing, honestly, that he was able to do that. But it speaks to his salesmanship, of course. But I have to wonder, you know, you mentioned you've got a guy who's a natural salesman and he's he's motivated. You know, obviously, he's been given this mission after the fact. And this guy, Bell, kind of falls into his lap. I think that was it the they were the tennis club or something or they lived in the same neighborhood, you said? Yeah, they lived uh, in, the same, in the same apartment complex. OK, OK, that's right. That's right. And then what is it that leads? I guess what my question is. You know, Bell needs money and he's lonely and he's got a lot of problems, of course, but that's still quite a leap to providing information to the, you know, the guys on the other side, so to speak. So was it simply that Zaharsky was able to kind of mitigate his concerns? I mean, what was it that led to Bell signing up to pass classified information for money? Exactly. Do you know what the actual process was or the, you know, the lever that he pushed on Bell to get him to start turning stuff over? Yeah, great question. So it starts with tennis. And Bell notices him. He comes on the court, you know, because the complex had a tennis court there. And there was a whole group of people, and they called themselves the Mini United Nations. So Bell was married to a, a woman from Belgium, Zaharsky, obviously, from Poland with his wife, Basia. And so the, the group with sort of foreigners in it, kind of hung out together and played tennis together. And so Bell and Zaharsky start to play tennis together. And Bell's not very good. And, you know, Zaharsky's in his, in his mid to late 20s and he's very good. And so, but Zaharsky lets Bell win a few times. And, and after tennis, they would always retire to either to Bell's house or to Zaharsky's house for vodka. And Zaharsky wasn't drinking vodka. He was drinking water, but he was giving Bell, he was plying Bell with vodka and Bell, you know, like, like drink. And after he would get a little tipsy, he would complain about his job at Hughes Aircraft. He felt that he he had been shunted aside. He felt like the younger guys were taking over, which actually really wasn't true. He was given some very important and highly classified work to do. But nonetheless, he felt like he was being ignored. And so Saharsky played on that and encouraged Bell to complain and basically turned himself into a confidant of Bell's. And what added to Zaharsky's ability to leverage that was the fact that several years earlier, Bell had, Bell's son had died during a camping accident in Mexico. Hmm. And that hole in his heart that had opened up with the death of his son in, in the camping ex- accident was filled in many ways by Zaharsky. Zaharsky, like Bell's son, was tall. Zaharsky, like Bell's son, was handsome. Zaharsky, like Bell's son, was sort of open and, and, and easy, to, easy, to, easy to contact and easy to talk to. And so Bell, kind of in a way, transferred this kind of his, his longing for his boy onto Zaharsky, and Zaharsky could leverage that as well. And then Zaharsky wow. proposed to Bell that Bell act as some type of representative or advisor to Polamco, the Polish firm that Zaharsky was representing. And so Zaharsky began to give Bell money 
but not because Bell was, quote unquote, committing a crime or sharing intelligence, but because Bell was providing Zaharsky with advice. And then slowly but surely, Bell began to give Zaharsky more stuff. And Zaharsky would use th- techniques like saying, hey, Bill, you know, my English is my technical English really needs some some some, some, some improvement. Could you give me some documents that might help me understand what you're saying to me better? <laughs> and that's how it began. Yeah. And yeah. as the envelopes thickened, I'm talking about cash, Bell began to really enjoy the fact that he was getting a significant amount of money from the polls. And he, he basically everybody knew, and you know, both he and Zaharsky knew that, that there was espionage going on, but it was this slow process, kind of like, you know, if you will, the growth of a cancer that allowed Zaharsky mm. to slowly take over and really begin to manipulate and control Bell. Okay, yeah, that, that makes perfect sense. And, you know, a lot of times if you see something on the news, for example, that, you know, is a story of an arrest by the FBI or something like that, you think, oh, what a horrible person this was, you know, to pass along classified information to our enemies. But it's rare that you get a glimpse into the, the, the creep that goes on, you know, the start of a, of a friendship at the tennis court, you know, versus the longing for his, his son who's passed away versus technical advisor versus digging out of a financial hole. And it starts to become a lot more understandable and believable at that point. Still wrong, of course, but it's really understandable how otherwise pretty good people get, can get caught up in this kind of thing. Exactly. And the, and the FBI has used this case as a model of how a foreign intelligence agency can cultivate and suborn Americans. So in that case is still being studied today in, in, in the FBI. Mm. Oh, that's fascinating. So you mentioned that he was working on stealth at some point at Hughes. What exactly did he pass? Any spe- specific stuff? Like you mentioned the B-1 bomber earlier. Did that ever become a part of the, you know, the intel drop that um, Zaharsky was able to provide? So Zaharsky has always claimed that in addition to Bell, he had other sources. No one else has been arrested by the FBI for their connections to Zaharsky. So I and I and and Zaharsky's case, the information on Zaharsky's case, the actual FBI investigation is still classified. Um, They obviously had to reveal some of it in the court in in, in federal court in Los Angeles. and And I've read those case files. But but we don't we don't actually know whether Zaharsky did have a separate separate source. What he hmm. got from Bell was all the information about something called low probability of intercept radar, which was an early iteration of the stealth technology that's in use now across the mil- all military platforms. Hmm. And that's what that's what the Hughes aircraft was working at. And the idea then was to begin using it in a variety of settings, and ultimately it was. Obviously, over time, it became more advanced, et cetera, et cetera. But this was the beginning of, of America beginning to experiment with this idea, which really befuddled initially the Poles. In fact, at one meeting of Polish experts, a Polish naval officer asked the question when they were talking about maybe using this type of technology on ships, he was like, how can you make a boat disappear? And so, <laughs> and so it clearly befuddled the Poles, and it also actually befuddled experts from the Soviet military as well. Hmm. Wow. And all because Bell lost his son in a camping accident, and the right guy at the right time, in the right place showed up at his apartment complex. Lisa, exactly. this dramatic loss of technology. Right. It did. It's amazing. And, and the Soviets estimated that it probably saved them. So did that, and this back. This was backed up by CIA research. Upwards of four hundred million dollars in in the dollars of the day that day, back in the back oh, in the eighties, wow. in terms of development money that they would had to they would have had to have spent. Would would they have wanted to develop a system like ours? My gosh, we yeah. really gave them a jump start for sure. There's always a weak link in the chain somewhere, and yeah, so they got it. So how exactly were these guys eventually caught? Was Bell caught first or is, uh, Zaharsky or, or what happened? So what happened, what happened was the, um, the CIA gets a tip that there is a spy robbing America blind based in Los Angeles. And they give the information to the FBI and the FBI begins, they kind of identify Zaharsky and they begin surveillance of Zaharsky. And sadly for the United States, the surveillance goes on for some 250 days, during which time Zaharsky is continuing to move documents 
to the consulate, the Polish consulate in Chicago, and actually directly onto flights to Warsaw and to Vienna. So the FBI is kind of watching all this stuff while it's actually happening in real time. They're following Zaharsky around LA. They're tailing his vehicle. They're, he's bumping into them in shopping malls. But finally, Zaharsky is, they, they, the FBI catch, catches wind that Zaharsky is going to be transferred back to Illinois, where Polamco, this company he works for, has its, has its corporate headquarters in the United States. And only at that point do they move and they move on Bell and they arrest him and bring him in. And they really don't have much, they haven't collected much evidence. Even though he's been committing these crimes over the course of these 250 days where he's being surveyed by the FBI, the FBI never caught him red-handed doing anything. And in fact, at one point, Zaharsky's pulled over uh, for speeding by an L.A. police officer, and he has pounds and pounds of cl highly classified documents in his, in, in his back seat, and the cop just gives him a speeding ticket doesn't worry about the classified hall on the back, which is understandable. He's a, he's a traffic cop, right? But nonetheless, it just shows that that while we were supposedly on top of this guy, he was he was you know the barn door was still open and he was stealing a lot of the chickens. But finally, they arrest Bell and they bring him in and they interrogate him. And instead of saying, "I want a lawyer, get out of my face," Bell basically slumps back in his chair, kind of nods his head down and says, I did it all. I don't need a lawyer. I will admit <laughs> to anything you say I did. And basically the FBI has Bell versus Saharsky. And what they then do is they bring in a U.S. attorney who looks at the evidence the FBI has amassed, which is basically bupkis. It's nothing. And he says, we got to have somebody wear a wire because we got to get, we have to have Saharsky on tape, at least admitting to doing something. So they wire Bell up, and this is back in the, we're talking early 80s, so it's like uh, the tape recorder attached by Velcro to the guy's back, right? This is not mm -hmm. like high tech. And they have him bring Zaharsky out onto the landing of the apartment, and, and they mumble a few words in which Bell says, oh, remember that secret stuff I gave you on the F-15? And Zaharsky goes, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Based on that, which is almost nothing, they then uh, arrest Zaharsky and prosecute him. Hmm. And this is... You know, we're talking 1981, right? And the historical background of the case is, you know, Poland is going through this upheaval with Solidarity Trade Union. And right before, you know, during the case, there's this buildup in Solidarity, these massive demonstrations. Everybody knows that a crackdown is coming and the case is kind of opens against this backdrop. So there's no way that the jury can really be kind of objective in terms of what evidence is actually being presented against Saharsky or not. The jury just kind of votes with history and they vote in 1981 to convict him. The judge then, several days after martial law is declared in Poland, sentences Zaharsky to life imprisonment. He's sent to the worst possible federal prison in Memphis, Tennessee. The FBI continues to try to lean on him to defect to the United States. He declines to defect. And in 1984, he's, uh, 1985, he's exchanged across the Bridge of Spies back to the Soviet bloc for 26 American agents who've been arrested and caught in East Germany. Hmm. Wow. So he went to the Bridge of Spies himself then. Indeed. Yeah, he, he was exchanged. And the fellow who exchanged him, um, who was managing the CIA side of the exchange, was uh, an officer by the name of John Palovich, who was also of Polish extraction, who was known in the agency as Mr. Poland. He was one of the great American intelligence officers uh, who was a specialist on Poland. In fact, over the course of his life, he managed some 18 Polish assets, which is extraordinary when you consider many successful case officers in the CIA would only manage one. Oh, absolutely. He was a huge part of the, the book, of course, and really fascinating as well, because I think I've seen his name before, but I had not really dug much into his story. So it was great to see it all laid out right there in, in the book. But before I go on... I do want to take a moment to fill you guys in on the newest tool that I'm wearing and carrying in daily life. It's the Donovan non-metallic knife from Black Triangle. If you aren't familiar with Black Triangle, then you're really missing out. I love these guys because they put the dagger in cloak and dagger. If you've been following me for a while now, then you probably already know why Black Triangle has called their newest non-metallic knife the Donovan. It's named after General William Wild Bill Donovan, the head of the U.S. Office of Strategic Services during World War II. Under Donovan, the OSS was unconventional, unexpected, and highly effective, just like Black Triangle's tools. 
The Donovan is manufactured here in the United States, is made entirely of G10 composite, and comes with a thermoplastic sheath and a couple of amazing extras, which you'll have to see for yourself. You can find it at blacktriangle.com. That's B-L-K triangle.com. You can also get 15% off your first order with Black Triangle using the discount code SPYCRAFT101 or by navigating to blktriangle.com slash SPYCRAFT101. I love mine, and I know you're going to love yours too. So, John, you mentioned John Palovich, and he had, I think you said, 18 sources over the course of his career, which is an incredible number of recruited sources for sure. How exactly did he get so good at that, and how did he manage so many sources? Well, John's tradecraft, and this is something that John noticed, was very similar to Zaharsky's tradecraft. They, unlike other uh, intelligence agents who sometimes put a potential source in a very compromising position in order to have leverage over them, sort of blackmail in a way, like if you don't work with me, I'm going to let your wife know that you visited a prostitute, that type of stuff. John didn't do that type of behavior. He was not a believer. He believed that using friendship and befriending them, similar to how Zaharsky suborned Bell, was, was the right way to go, which is one of the reasons why they're, they're kind of developed relatively quickly, this unspoken bond between Palovich and Zaharsky. Palovich managed on, for the CIA the, the, the exchange over the Bridge of Spies, and he returned to America after having read all of Zaharsky's case file committed to the idea that should the opportunity arise in the future, he would like very much to work with and not against the likes of Marion Zaharsky. Uh, and ultimately had that opportunity years later. Hmm. Was that working as like an equal partner or he wanted to recruit him as another one of his agents? Well, recruitment was always a possibility with John, but ultimately he really believed, uh, partially because maybe of, of his eth ethnic identity, but also because of the sense that Poles and Americans were just not good natural enemies. So he believed ultimately at a certain point there was going to be a change in Poland and that when that change happened, he wanted to be in there getting Polish spies to work on, on behalf and with the United States. Sure. So how did he end up going about this? How did he go ahead and, and kind of make friends formally with elements of the Polish government towards the end of the Cold War there? So the Cold War ends basically in 1989, 1990, and Poland is involved in this kind of rocky transition from a communist satellite of the Soviet Union to an independent country, a republic, a sort of a democracy. And in Poland at the time, there was a very active debate about what to do with all the people who had served as communists under the communist system. Did you fire them all and sort of send them out to pasture? Did you fire, would you fire all the generals in the military? Would you fire all the spies in the, in the, inter, in the Ministry of Interior Affair, Internal Affairs? Would you fire all the police officers? I mean, what would you do in, in order to create the new Poland? And there were elements within the Polish government, uh, the sort backed by the Solidarity Trade Union, who wanted to cleanse Poland of all communist influence. But in the end, the faction that won was the faction that said, look, if we don't give the communists the stake in the new Poland, they're going to go into the woods and we're going to have a revanchist anti-Western revolution on our hands by all these people who haven't been given a stake in the new Poland. And so the decision was made not to fire all the cops, not to fire all the bureaucrats, not to fire all the teachers and not to fire all the spies. And the administration of George H.W. Bush and the CIA were actively involved in encouraging the Poles to take that decision, to draw, as one, one Polish prime minister said, a thick line between the past and the present and not prosecute those people for being communists, but work with them and bring them into a new Poland. And the CIA did it for two reasons. One, because it was a way to guarantee stability, but also, two, because the CIA, through people like Palowicz, knew just how good the Polish spies were. So in March of 1990s, Palovich gets approval to go to Lisbon, uh, partially because Portuguese counterintelligence wasn't considered very, they weren't really alive at the switch, let's just put it that way. And he contacts a noted, a known Polish spy there. And he says, look, my name's John Palovich. For the first time in my career, I'm traveling on my real passport. Here's my home number. 
Uh, I rep- represent the CIA, and if your intelligence agencies want to have a relationship with us, we'd like to start meeting. At the time, the Polish intelligence officer denies, of course, being a Polish spy. He kicks Palovich out of his office. He says he's shocked, shocked that anyone could think that he was a Polish spy. But then that <laughs> night, right. he sends a cable back to Warsaw saying, hey, the CIA just came knocking, knocking. What do I do? And his and his minister in Warsaw says, OK, we need this. Call him back. Get him to send a delegation of American spies to to to, to Lisbon. We'll meet. And so they meet. A delegation comes down from Warsaw in May of 1990 to Lisbon. A delegation comes from the U.S. and they meet in the Hotel Tivoli for numerous hours in the room that was rented by an American senior American intelligence officer, and they formally begin a cooperative relationship. And that then leads to partnerships around the world for the next three decades. Wow. It's hard to imagine what it would have been like to be a, a fly on the wall in a meeting like that where you're laying out just an entirely new relationship and an, you know, an entirely new dawning of a, a future relationship between two countries that have been you know, at odds, to say the least, for the past, what, 40 something years at that exactly. point, and they just decided to figure it out and, and they just made it happen between the right. two of them. And, and these men, I mean, these men had been cold, cold War foes and literally over the course of an afternoon, that bled into a dinner party, that, but the dinner party only ended at nine. <laughs> they basically begin a new relationship and history changes. Hmm. That's incredible. And that's, that's really is, like you said, I think it goes back to our, our cultures being so intertwined for so many years that they could do that. I can't imagine us doing that with the, the Bulgarian security services or, or anyone else, you know, around that same time period, for example. Definitely. So, this is, you're talking about 1990 now, of course, we're leading in to this new conflict in the Middle East with Iraq. And so tremendous end of an era there, but also the beginning of a new era of American involvement in the Middle East or heightened military involvement anyway, I should say. So, you know, things are taking a, a serious turn for the worse as these Iraqi forces are invading Kuwait. And at the same time, like you mentioned in the book, there are U.S. staffers in Kuwait City who are kind of trapped by this speedy invest invasion. So how exactly did that play out at the time with all these Americans trapped there and Iraqi military rolling into the country? So Saddam invades Kuwait in August of 1990. And, you know, we had a substantial U.S. diplomatic presence in Kuwait. We also had a pretty substantial military presence because we sold the Kuwaitis a lot of armaments in Kuwait as well. And at the time, we also had an important officer who came as a representative of General Norman Schwarzkopf, who was at the time the commander of CENTCOM down in Florida, who had come to Kuwait with satellite photos to try to convince the the El Sabah family, the ruling family, the Emir of Kuwait, that Saddam's threats to invade Kuwait were serious and they had better uh, figure out something to do either to counter it or to get the hell out of Dodge. And... So that officer, John Feely, was also, he was part of Schwarzkopf's intelligence cell. And Feely also had been working on plans about what CENTCOM would do to counter the Iraqi, in the, what they you know, believed to be the imminent Iraqi invasion. They didn't know it was going to happen so quickly, but Feely was confident the invasion was happening. And he'd been working on how the United States would counter it. So in his head, he had a lot of information that if the Iraqis knew it, would be very useful for them to counter the American attempt to counter Saddam's invasion. And so after some negotiation, after uh, Saddam invades Kuwait, they allow the, all the American diplomats to leave Kuwait City and drive in a convoy, which is pretty, a pretty harrowing journey, from Kuwait City to Baghdad like 120 degree heat, pets are dying, kids are facing significant, American kids are facing significant heat, heat stroke and heat exhaustion, et cetera. And in that group, there are six people of particular interest to the United States that the United States wants to get out of Iraq. There are three NSA communicators who kind of know the codes and would be a goldmine to any intelligence services should they be arrested. There's the station chief of the CIA in Kuwait, 
And there's two American military officers, a gentleman named Fred Hart, who had done some freelance work with the CIA. And then there's John Feely, the representative, the major, the representative from General Schwarzkopf. And very, very soon, basically, the Americans conclude that they got to get these guys out of Iraq. They don't want them falling into Saddam Hussein, because remember, at the time, Saddam Hussein was doing this human shield type thing, right, where foreigners, Westerners were being placed in areas like that were sensitive and so that Saddam could would, would try to use that as a way so that it wouldn't be attacked or bombed later by, by Western forces. So the Americans kind of think about all sorts of ways to get them out, maybe just try to sneak them out through Jordan, punch out into Syria. We actually contact the Brits, the French, the Russians even, but everyone's so busy getting their own people out, they don't have any time to help us. So finally, we go to the polls, backed by people in the CIA like John Palovich and like Bill Norville, who at the time was the CIA station chief in Warsaw, who said, look, the polls could handle something like this. We could, we could trust the polls. It was further bolstered, the case for Poland was further bolstered by the fact that the polls had thousands of workers, construction workers in Iraq at the time. So that type of a cover was, would be very useful for moving men out of Iraq. And so we went to the polls in a meeting at a park, like, you know, your typical spy versus spy thing. We met with the polls officers in a park in Warsaw. Bill Norville presented the idea and he basically said, we need your help. And it basically took the polls about 24 hours, more like six hours actually to say, we're gonna do this. And it wasn't the top of the Polish government that made this decision. It was a guy who was a vice minister of interior in Poland who made the decision. And he did, he took the decision himself because he knew that anyone above his pay grade might be really worried about what would happen if this operation went south, right? If it was, you know, exposed that the Poles were trying to take out Americans. If the Americans were caught, they could very well be executed. The Polish officer might be executed, and that would risk the lives of thousands of Polish workers who were also waiting to leave Iraq. But this minister was a gambler. And he believed that this gamble would be important because it would show to the Americans that Poland was going to be and wanted to be an ally of the United States. Poland didn't want to be independent of Soviet or American influence. Poland wanted to put itself and root itself in the Western camp. And that decision was a huge. It was also important for the ex-communists in the Polish intelligence agency to show not only to the new Polish government, but also to the Americans that they were no longer communists, that they were ready to work with America and cooperate and collaborate with the United States going forward. So in Poland, a lot of people had a lot, a lot of things to prove in, in approving this operation. And so it then begins in October of early October of, of 1990, the Poles dispatched Grobosław Czempinski, who was a heralded Warsaw Pact agent, down to Iraq to solve this problem. Well, that is that's so incredible to me. I understand, you know, the way you explain it, it makes perfect sense why we had to go to the polls with everybody else already worried about getting their own people out and us not able to do so out of the center of Baghdad. But at the same time, like you said, it was what, March of 1990 when our guys kind of hashed out a new relationship. And now the first test of this relationship is them, you know, taking custody of, of six of our absolute most valuable people in the world. You know, NSA codebreaker, CIA chief of station, these you know, very important military planners. That's that's an incredible leap of faith for the U.S. to go to Warsaw hat in hand and say, please get these incredibly valuable people out using your own methods. Exactly. And in an operation that was totally, well, I mean, they, the, 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 the two agencies, the Polish intelligence agency and the CIA worked this very closely together. But at the end of the day, the guy on the ground doing, moving the people, they were all Poles. Right. And they really ran the operation, which re definitely rubbed the CIA station chief the wrong way because he initially tried to pretend as if he was the guy who was going to run it. And he was quickly put in his place by the polls who said, listen, pal, <laughs> this is this is our deal. Right. right. <laughs> and right. Uh, that created some tension at the beginning. But in the end, it was very successful, proving that the polls really had excellent trade craft and could be trusted. Absolutely. So what was the method that they used to actually get these guys out of country right under the noses of Saddam's army? Well, the, 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 the issue was basically they had to turn them into Poles. 
And, and they and they ultimately decided when they heard that the CIA officers attempt to pronounce their Polish names because they created six fake Polish passports with six fake Polish names. In fact, Palowicz chose the names and he tried to choose Polish names that Americans could pronounce. But these Americans couldn't even pronounce those relatively simplistic <laughs> Polish names. Once once Chempinski heard them pronounce their names, he said, not only are you going to be Polish workers, but you're going to be drunk Polish workers. And so literally at a critical point, he douses them with Johnny Walker Black in order to have them masquerade themselves as drunk Polish workers. They're wearing Polish work, Polish working overalls. Like I said, they all have fake Polish passports. And Chimpinski basically had to turn them into Polish drunks in order to get them out of the country. One of the, one of the problems along the way is that at a certain point, they bumped into a Polish-speaking Iraqi border guard. And that <laughs> oh caused a significant, that pucker factor was very high. But he schmoozed his way through that checkpoint as well. Wow. Well, wow. that's the last thing you expect to find at an Iraqi checkpoint is a Polish speaker, I guess. Well, it's interesting because, you know, they were friendly, right? There was a sort of Saddam actually had very close relations with Poland. So thousands of, Pol of Iraqis did study, for example, medicine in Poland. So there's no shortage, actually, of the Polish-speaking Iraqis back in the day. Those connections oh, okay. were strong. So it wasn't that outrageous. The problem was that the Iraqi, the, the Poles had thought that all those Polish-speaking guys were in southern Iraq. And suddenly one shows up in northern Iraq. And they had chosen that northern Iraq exodus because they believed that there were no Pol Polish speaking border guards up there. And then they bumped into one. And it was like, oh, my God, what do we do now? Wow. So do you know how they were able to kind of finesse their way through that situation? Was it just, you know, maintaining calm and building a little rapport and then going on through? Keep calm and carry on. It was basically cigarettes and booze. That's what they did to grease their way up. And they uh, declined the Polish-speaking uh, Iraqis' invitation for dinner. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> I can imagine. I can imagine. Wow, that's amazing. So they made it across the border. Were these Americans, were they taken all the way on to Poland from there or met by, you know, a U.S. plane or, or what exactly? No, so across the border in Iraq, they uh, were met by Poles. The United States didn't want to involve Turkey in the operation just because of complexity's sake. The fewer sure. intelligence services involved in a joint operation, the better, right? right? And so they were met by Polish officers, intelligence officers, who drove them to Ankara. And then from Ankara, they all took an overnight bus to Istanbul. And then from Istanbul, they flew on a lot airlines flight from Istanbul to Warsaw, where they were met by the CIA station chief and feted given a couple hundred bucks so they could buy some new clothes, which they did at PEVEX, which was Poland's state-owned, big state-owned retail center there, and then flown back to the United States. Hmm. Sounds like all's well that ends well. So this, obviously, this is just a, a complete success, it sounds like, and it was kind of the first test of this new relationship. So how did the Polish and American intelligence relationship move forward after that? Are they like still you know close to this day, for example? So... After that, it basically creates this blood bond between the two services, which was concretized in November of 1990 when William Webster, Judge Webster, as the CIA director's secret trip to first trip to Eastern Europe, a secret trip to Eastern Europe, to basically formalize the relationship. And it's off to the races. The Poles have spied for the United States across the globe in those early years when people, you know, countries didn't really know that Poland was intent on becoming a staunch American ally. There was this kind of gray area that the Poles could function in. They had a lot of operatives based in Pyongyang, for example, giving American intelligence about what was happening in North Korea. Hmm. They had people in Tehran. They had people in Cuba. They had people very close to the Hezbollah in Lebanon. So they could provide America with a very important perspective. In addition, they also had deep ties into the KGB and in Russia. And that was very important in providing American information about the Russians, because we obviously had an adversarial relationship with our Russian counterparts, but the Poles had been very close to the KGB. And then suddenly they switched sides and they began to provide the United States with a huge amount of information about what was happening in Russia that America just couldn't get its hands on. Wow. Wow. That, that's incredible that we've suddenly got access to what's going on in Pyongyang, like you mentioned, and Moscow and and elsewhere with this huge network of, of Polish intelligence agents. And in some ways, you can trace it back to 
like you said, Zaharski and the skill and talent that he showed using against us in the United States, plus Palovich, you know, kind of putting it all out there on the line and flying in his true name to go talk to the Polish intelligence services in 1990. And, and those acts and a few others just bore tremendous fruit, it sounds like, over the next few years. Exactly, Justin. Exactly. That's fantastic. That's what a wonderful story. I really appreciate you coming on here because this is one of my favorite books that I've I've read in quite some time. I really appreciate uh, so, it. Yeah, and absolutely. You know, this, this alliance continues to this day, right? I mean, right now Poland is facing significant problems on its eastern border with Belarus sort of weaponizing refugees, right? And so when people think, well, why is Secretary of State Blinken having a conversation with his Polish counterpart over this crisis? Well, Poland's an ally in the United States for a specific reason. They really went to bat for America in a variety of places. And Iraq wasn't the only one. And they saved the lives of Americans. And they've done a lot to work for the United States as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think they've been a very staunch partner of ours throughout the global war on terror. They've had troops in Iraq and Afghanistan and possibly elsewhere, you know, right alongside American troops for years now. Exactly. Well, wow, fascinating. So, you know, I encourage everybody to read this book once again. The title is From Warsaw with Love, and it's by John Pomfret. And John, thank you so much for coming on. Are you working on another book right now, or what are you up to now that this has been published? Well, you know, I'm trying to sell my current book. So once, I, once, I, <laughs> once I knock my head against the wall enough, then I'll probably move on to another project. But thank you so much again. Great. Absolutely. Yeah, I encourage you guys to pick this up if you can. We've really just kind of skimmed the surface of it in some ways. There's a much larger cast of characters in the book than just the few that we've talked about here. A lot of other stories of cooperation, collaboration, and a lot more details about some of the things that we talked about briefly here. So I've got a copy. I love it. And I encourage you to pick up from Warsaw with Love as well. So John, is there anywhere that people can connect with you online? Do you have like a public facing profile? Uh, if people yeah, wanna I, get I have more a website, johnpomfret.com. And there's a contact form there. I have a Twitter feed, J-E-P Pomfret, and those are two places where I'm happy to, and you can send me emails off that as well. Great. Well, thank you so much for sharing this story with us. I really appreciate it, John. Thanks a lot, Justin. It was great to be All here. All right. Goodbye. Bye. If you're interested in more of Spycraft 101, look for my page on Instagram, at Spycraft 101, or connect with me on Patreon. My patrons get exclusive access to long-form blog posts that dive deep into some of the most amazing stories in the history of espionage and receive free or discounted books and products from the Spycraft 101 store. That includes a free PDF copy of my own book, Spy Shots Volume 1, 101 True Tales from the World of Espionage. I want to say a big thank you to all of my patrons, including Robert S. and Joshua W. With your support, I've been able to continue funding my research and publication across multiple platforms to date. Thank you all for listening, and I hope you'll stick around because there's lots more to come. Thanks for listening to this program brought to you by Daydreamer Network. If you enjoyed the episode, please don't forget to rate and review on Apple Podcasts or your preferred platform. Your feedback allows us to rank on the best new shows list and continue to grow our podcasts in order to bring more unique and talented storytellers to the network. To check out our shows, including programs about relationships, sports, business, nutrition, leisure, and more, head to www.daydreamernetwork.com. We look forward to seeing you back next week for another great episode. Have a wonderful day.